Welcome to Guns, Guns, Gear, and Guns with Gary Gunderson. I am Gary Gunderson, and Joe Biden has done it. He has come for your guns, or at least your 80% lowers and so-called ghost guns. In his announcement speech, Biden acknowledged that he could not pass it through Congress and instead use the authority of regulatory agencies to pass this. Because I was having trouble getting things passed in the Congress, but I used what we call regulatory authority. Yay, bureaucracy. And then he introduced his next head of the FT, as he said over and over again. Today, to lead and support the dedicated men and women of the AFT, I'm proud to nominate Steve Dittelbeck. Excuse me, I mispronounced your name. I just, as director of Bureau of Fact. They don't write the laws. Yes, you did. Because I read it all 364 agonizing pages and the AFT's final rule from last year's proposed rule changing the definition of what constitutes a firearm to be things that aren't really quite firearms. But what does that mean for you? Let's go over the highlights. Let's say some good first. They did change their proposed definition of frames and receivers to fit the current trend of serialization that we are doing already. The fear was, take an AR-15 for example, it has an upper and lower receiver that both kind of fit the definition of firearm under the proposed rule, and both would need to be serialized, or even worse, some interpretations of the proposed definition had 10 or more parts on AR fitting the definition of quote-unquote firearm receivers that would need serialized, like a magazine catch. However, they have gone with the current trend, so just the lowers on NAR, just the frames on most pistols, but that's not everything. They also will not require any 80% or kits in hand of non-FFL holders to be serialized. However, if you ever sell your firearm to an FFL holder or take your personally made firearm, or PMF as they call it, in for a repair that lasts more than one day, they will need to add serialization to it. So if you have something that lasts a couple days repair or trigger job, it's going to be serialized and then tracked. That's it for the list of good? On to the bad. They're now requiring all FFL holders to keep their 4473 transfer records forever. Not just the previously required 20 years, and as the GOA would say, this is effectively an attempt at a backdoor registry in that they can just track down just about everything except for personal face-to-face -face sales now. They're considering non-firearms, firearms. That's the big thing. Basically, they're saying that if you have a parts kit with a jig, it's a firearm. But it goes beyond that. They say again and again that it's quote-unquote readily convertible into a frame or receiver that is a firearm, but it is still vague. No matter how many times the ATF insists that this isn't at all vague, guys, within the language of this rule, like multiple times, again and again, their conclusion is that when it is a block of metal or filament it is not a firearm until it, quote, has reached a stage of manufacture where it can be readily completed, assembled, restored, or otherwise converted into a functional frame or receiver, end quote. But that still leaves us with readily hanging over us. It does say that it excludes a forging, casting, printing, extrusion, unmachined body, or similar article that has not yet reached a stage of manufacture where it is clearly identifiable as an unfinished component part of a weapon. So at what point can you identify it as an unfinished component of a weapon? Just a block with an outer shape of an AR receiver or Glock frame with nothing milled out from it inside, I could identify that as a part? So does that count as a firearm? They do give some examples of what is and is not a receiver. Partially completed frames or receivers with template holes drilled or indexed in the correct location. Or, even if it's not quite destroyed the way the ATF likes it in a parts kit, are both firearms. Thankfully, it is not a receiver if it's an AR blank without critical interior areas having been indexed, machined, or formed 
that is not sold, distributed, or possessed with instructions, jigs, templates, equipment, or tools such that it may readily be completed is not a receiver. So can I sell jigs for ARs just by themselves as long as I don't also sell the blanks? After all, they are pretty standard sizing. What if I already had made an 80% lower using a jig and just go ahead and buy more 80% now and use the same jig personally? They wouldn't necessarily know I have it. And this makes it seem like an 80% without a jig is legal, but does it say that it is either? I do appreciate that an AK flat is not a receiver if it does not have cuts or indexing as long as it is sold without accompanying jigs, instructions, etc. Which of course means that a flat piece of metal with a piece of paper that are instructions can be considered a receiver. This is ridiculous. Indeed, the ATF acknowledges that this new definition of quote-unquote firearm requires a case-by-case -case evaluation of each kit, and it would be impossible to quote, set forth in the regulations a precise minimum percentage of completion, maximum time period, maximum level of expertise, or type of number of parts necessary to convert each and every make, model, and configuration of weapon parts kits now in existence or that may be produced in the future, end quote. So the ATF in the ruling says it's impossible to make a regulation that covers every circumstance. So partially made receivers are done then because you would have to appeal every cut to the ATF as to when a primordial block of metal, as they put it, becomes a receiver. Their rule has the very same problem most commenters I imagine listed that readily is too vague and then they acknowledge that they don't know without looking at each and every one. I can point to a footnote to see what they mean though. Under one of those readilies, they refer to several court cases which starts out as semi-reasonable and then gets to the absurd. The first refers to a case about a starter pistol that can be converted from firing blanks to 22s in 12 minutes. With one of the last examples referring to a case where making a machine gun operable with an eight hour working day in a properly equipped machine shop was considered readily restored to shoot. What? Then it throws a little breadcrumb and says that a case was not readily restored when it required a master gunsmith and a gun shop with $65,000 worth of equipment and tools. So I guess a measly $60,000 worth of equipment is fair game to being readily made to shoot. Nice note the government thinks is readily convertible, I guess. There are some gems and oddities buried in this rule, like how someone argued that the rule inhibits First Amendment rights because it would, quote, chill an artisan that wanted to use gun parts in art, but was afraid to then have to require an FFL to complete their piece, which is just wonderful, but apparently was not persuasive to the ATF. It's also funny how the ATF argues in this rule that the lack of serialization means that they cannot prosecute straw purchases of ghost guns, which if they are ghost guns, they could just purchase them themselves, even if they couldn't. Isn't that the whole point of this ruling? Why are they arguing they can't prosecute straw purchases when the whole point is that you can't? What are they talking about? There's a bit, even where if you add a serial number yourself on your personally made firearm, the FFL you sell it to still has to add their own serial number based on their FFL. So if you serialize it, I don't know, LGB1 or BOO1, they would still have to add a prefix to your own custom serial number. Also, I find it convenient that one of the arguments against this rule was how few instances the ATF recorded in the initial rule proposal, but suddenly they found all these other instances of maybe ghost guns in between so they meet a reasonableness standard. That's convenient. Or how they keep mentioning that they are changing the definition of frame or receiver because things such as the 1911 or AR-15 were quote unquote, originally manufactured almost exclusively for military use. 
echoing Biden's constant brain nonsense that these are weapons of war, even though by the time they came up with this definition, lots of pistols and firearms were in the hands of and marketed to civilians with this same setup. It's just a political point they threw in there a couple of times as a way to score points with their boss, I guess, not that he would realize it. I guess be thankful they are not regulating 3D printing CAD files and they did not follow the California Department of Justice's comment that said the rule should force all non-licensees who own privately made firearms to get them serialized. And that being said, of the 290,000 comments, 114,000 expressed support for the rule. Less than half, but still a sad, sad amount. It was a good showing from the gun community, but it was not enough. Oh, and don't forget that even though they talk about how reasonable they are and kept it to serializing one part, they also say that future designs without a ruling from the ATF could require more than one part to be serialized, even though they agree that would put undue stress on the gun industry. What a bunch of clowns. Anyways, what do you think about the new ruling? I have a pretty good guess. Let me know in the comments. What do you think of this new ATF director nominee? I don't know much about him yet. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. Thanks for watching.